When the original Top Gear series was cancelled by the BBC in 2001, former Top Gear presenter Jeremy Clarkson and producer Andy Willman started planning for a Top Gear revival with a new format and style. The original Top Gear had been running since 1977 and only resembles the modern day Top Gear in a few ways, such as the theme tune and the fact that they are, you know, both car shows. The original Top Gear didn't have a studio home, in fact it didn't even broadcast nationally to begin with. It started in 1977 on BBC Midlands, and it wasn't until 1978 that the show went nationwide. The show was originally presented by Angela Rippon, with several co-presenters alongside. Rippon left the show in 1980 before being succeeded by none other than Noel Edmonds. The original Top Gear was heavily based around helpful consumer advice. The show did dabble in other aspects of cars such as motorsport but generally the show was to work as consumer advice, which cars were on the market and which are affordable. A modern day example of the original Top Gear would have to be Fifth Gear, which is certainly similar. In 1988, Jeremy Clarkson made his presenting debut on Top Gear. The ratings at the time were a healthy 5 million. As the years went by, presenters came and went. Motor journalist Quentin Wilson, who went on to present Fifth Gear, joined the show in 1991. Despite complaints from the lesser informed that the show was overly macho and was bad for the environment, sound familiar, the show continued to pull in decent numbers, especially for BBC Two. Then came 1999. James May and Kate Humble, among others, joined the presenting team. The ratings then began to slowly decline. This wasn't helped by the fact that in January 1999, Clarkson announced his departure. The show kept going, with the ratings eventually dipping to below 3 million. The show was cancelled in 2001, however, the BBC were keen to revive the show, given how they desperately wanted to make a motoring show. Jeremy Clarkson and his producer friend Andy Willman, who himself presented a few Top Gear segments, began planning for a new Top Gear with a new format. The format was to include a permanent racetrack for car reviews and lap times. The lap times would be undertaken by none other than a mysterious figure known only as the Stig but we'll get to him later. There would also be celebrity guests who would drive around the track in a reasonably priced car. Clarkson and Wilman pitched this new format to the BBC and obviously BBC said yes to the idea and the new Top Gear was greenlit for an awesome 2002 air date. Unlike the original Top Gear, Clarkson's new vision of Top Gear were comprised of three presenters rather than a revolving ensemble. The presenters of the first series which aired in 2002 were Jeremy Clarkson, the main presenter who, as discussed already, presented the original run for 11 years, Jason Dorr, a motoring journalist, James May, who presented a few episodes of the original run, declined to take part in the new Top Gear, having been offered a presenting role by Clarkson. The third and final presenter was Richard Hammond, a motoring journalist who had previously worked on local BBC radio stations. However, while there were three presenters, there was also another character on board. It was the Stig. The show needed a professional racing driver for the lap times, Clarkson and Wilman came up with the idea of an anonymous racing driver who never speaks. The original Stig was later revealed to be Perry McCarthy, who was in the show for the first two series he left in the opening episode of Series 3. What was typical for Top Gear Series 1 was for Jeremy and Richard to review the latest cars, ranging from supercars to sports cars to hatchbacks and anything else. Same old Top Gear, right? Wrong. Jason Dorr would typically review second-hand models and provide consumer advice. Rarely would all three presenters be assembled on location somewhere, whether that be on the track or somewhere else. The first series had low but consistent audience, ranging from 3 to 2 million viewers and averaging 3.30 million. The BBC commissioned a second series, which aired from the spring of 2003, and that included a number of changes. The biggest change in series 2 was the presenting lineup. Jeremy Clarkson stayed, obviously. Richard Hammond stayed, despite some of the BBC wanting him replaced. However, Jason Dorr left the series after just 10 episodes. James May was offered his presenting role in 2002, but declined because he didn't think the new format would work. Once he saw the figures and good reviews, he decided to join the show. So, Dorr was replaced by May, and the presenting lineup wouldn't change until 2016, a whole 13 years later. Because Series 2 came just a few months after Series 1, the format did not radically change. At this stage, the series had low, but consistent viewing figures, so there was no reason to axe the show, but also no real incentive to shake up the format. Beyond the obvious presenting shake-up, there isn't much distinction between Series 1 and 2. In Autumn 2003, the third series aired. This series included the now well-known and remembered Toyota Hilux Challenge. 
the series was now gradually turning into the show that most people recognise from a few years down the line. Due to various reasons, all of which seem to contradict each other, Perry McCarthy decided to leave Top Gear and so his stig was written out of the show in the first episode. He was replaced by Ben Collins, whose identity as a white stig would remain a secret until 2010. Series 3 reached a ratings high of 5.40 million, a very promising and encouraging figure. Interestingly, Series 1 and 2 had 10 episodes each, and Series 3 had 9 episodes. The lower budget would have allowed the producers to make more episodes than later series, which were generally ranging from 6 to 7 episodes per series, with an occasional extension. With each new series, the format became increasingly outlandish, and the show got a bigger and bigger budget. The celebrity guests were more and more famous, and the overall look of the show gradually became glossier and glossier. Ratings were gradually going up. No longer were 2 to 3 million tune in, now 3 to 4 million would tune in, in a gradual but promising increase. Then on the 20th of September 2006, while filming Top Gear, Richard Hammond was involved in a crash of over 300 miles per hour. Crash was well publicised at the time, and there was genuine concern over Hammond's condition and what would happen to the series. In fact, at the time, I'd only seen a few episodes of Top Gear and wasn't overly familiar with the show and the format. Production on the show was halted and the loyal fanbase and the country waited for any news. The show was postponed, but eventually returned to air on the 28th of January 2007. The crash was shown in the episode and the dangerous situation was made more apparent to the viewers. As Hammond's crash had been all over the news and papers, this car show with a small but dedicated audience now found itself receiving a lot of publicity. The ratings for the returning episode were 8.13 million, one of the most watched episodes of Top Gear. Series 8 from the year before averaged 4.45 million. This series, the ninth, averaged 7.45 million. The future of the show was secured, but certainly not in a way the makers would have liked. Series 9 also featured the US special, whereby the presenters drove from Miami to New Orleans in three second-hand cars to determine if renting is more economical than buying. The special itself was very difficult to film, certainly because of the uncomfortable heat and the famous segment where the presenters drove with graffitied slogans on their cars. The special has gone down in Top Gear history as one of the most memorable specials. Very few people in America knew what Top Gear was at the time, so this made filming even more inconvenient. There had already been one Top Gear special so far, the Winter Olympic special with a famous mini-sequence. But really it was with the US special that has more in common with future specials than the Winter Olympic special. While Top Gear had produced many noteworthy and iconic episodes before 2007, it was really with Series 9 where the show really went into a higher gear and was really very much put on the map for a mainstream audience, rather than just a small but loyal one. 